Yes, uh, today I'm going to talk about crafting shapes and the impact on finishing mechanics. Uh, I know that the um, the title is a little bit cryptic, but uh, let me just give you um, let me just give you an overview. Uh, in my talk, the idea in here is just to study growth, and 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 as you know, growth is a very old topic, um, and you might have encountered this uh, looking. You know, on, in the park, for example, uh, how butterfly, this is a metamorphosis of a monarch butterfly. And then you can see that the, there are different stages and all of these stages are mediated through growth, right? And in here, you can see that how the butterfly goes from an egg to a larva and, and then a, a pupa and then a, a beautiful butterflies. But this is not just solely for animals. We know very well, um, let me see, why is this not moving? We know very well, uh, that this is just going time, but also for us, for humans, we know that uh, that but that we grow, right? We start as a baby, as you can see here, and and then we have this uh, for the people that has kids. Uh, you know that uh, very well. This is what they call the growth curve uh, for for babies, and um, where they just measure uh, if your kid is growing fine or not. And of course, it's not the only thing that it grows. But whoever has kids that also knows that entropy in the house also grows. Um, and in general, this, this is a very old topic. Uh, and I'm, in this talk, I'm going to try to give you a, a new spin in all of this. And if you wanted to see how old this actually is, this, this goes back to the 1700s, right? This is very, very old topic. And perhaps the one that um, uh, in approached me uh, to this subject, it was uh, uh, Darcy Thompson, uh, in which uh, he has studied basically how different fish, actually, if you do simple mathematical uh, uh, deformation of, of a given fish, then you can obtain other type of fish. So kind of like a showing that there is uh, some uh, underlying uh, mechanism for, uh, for growth. Right. So uh, there, are, there are many ways to classify growth. Uh, and here I'm gonna just give you more the standardized way. Uh, the sim a simple classification is to think about uh, three pi uh, pillars of growth. One is growth, which is the change of mass or volume, right? The other one uh, is called remodeling. Uh, this remodeling, it means that uh, there is a change of the material properties and the structure on itself of a uh, thing that you, you are looking at. And then the other one is morphogenesis in general. So in here, this in here you can see the morphogenesis of a, a human heart. These three things are interconnected with each other, right? So we have we cannot have morphogenesis without growth uh, and without remodeling. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk uh, generally about growth and the change of mass or volume, right? And within growth, uh, we can just even classify further the type of growth. In general, uh, this is basically the growth happens on, at the level of the surface, or this happens at the level of the bulk in growth. So one of the prototypical growth that it was established uh, in the in the 1700s is uh, what is called apical growth. This is the growth, for example, of a, of a plant root, and you can see that the uh, the the mass is basically produced at the tip of the of, of the root. The other one is surface growth, which is prototypical of, for example, of seashells or the horns of an antelope and things like that. And the other one, this is bulk growth. And in this case, uh, this is a biofilm in where I'm just talking about bulk in the sense that when, if you just do this in the lab, uh, you will see that it forms like a, what is called a coffee ring. This coffee ring uh, basically generates a boundary and then everything goes inside of that boundary in, in, in the bulk. Um, if you are interested in this in this subject, I, I will uh, highly recommend you this book in here from uh, Alan uh, Gorley about the mathematica and the mechanics of growth. And in this talk, I'm going to just focus even further in bulk growth. Right. So uh, in here, let me show you, this is uh, the um, morphogenesis of a salamander. I will let you take just 30 seconds to a minute in order that you can appreciate this. Uh, this you can see here uh, how uh, a salamander goes from a zygote, which is basically a single cell, to a modula, 16 cells, then blastula. And then in here you can see 
uh, the cleavage, which is the formation of the of the cavity and the gastrulation, which is a symmetry breaking process uh, where the neural tube is formed. And as you can see, this is a multi-scale um, process that happens in the case of the, the salamander, it happens a, a, along three weeks, right? And then you can see in here, uh, after the formation of the neural tube, uh, it gets aside where is the head and where is the tail. Uh, and then you can see that it's a lot of movement. And, and, and this really, really excites, uh, uh, is, a, is of excitement for physicists, given that in here there are happening many, many things. And this is a multi-scale problem. So we can just try to understand this problem from many uh, point of view. Right. Now, uh, a modern view on, on, on growth, uh, this is just jumping um, several centuries. We can just think about this as, a, as, as the following uh, diagram that you have in here. So this is, we have a change, uh, there is a change at the biochemical level, right? Which you get just detected by the cell. Then there is a change at the physical level. This, this could be, as I said before, it could be growth, material properties, or active forces. This, this just introduces partial uh, temporal changes. And at the end of the day, I get some morphological phenotype, right? And this morphological phenotype, it could be a limb or it could be something else, right? And this 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 will be the the like a very abstract and and high overview on 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 how we can see uh, growth, and on itself is a subject of of research. And in this talk, I'm gonna just focus on changes on the physical level and see what are kind of the morphological phenotypes that I can just get after all. Uh, for modeling, uh, in this case, uh, I'm going to focus on tissue growth. For modeling tissue growth, uh, there are many flavors that you can just pick on. Uh, this is going to depend on the scale that you are interested in and also on the level of the detail that you are interested in. Right. So, for example, discrete models and vertex models and particle-based models, that you for sure have heard this before in other talks, it allows you a, a high level of detail. You can add things in each of these, uh, let's call it, uh, uh, as, as spherical cells, right? Um, so you can you can add a lot of details and, and a lot of dynamics, particular from the particular systems. But the problem with this is that uh, we are limited by the number of uh, elements that we can just uh, work on, right? Then we can go to the other extreme, which is basically using reaction diffusion or in general elasticity problem, in where you can just model more mesoscopic uh, 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 systems. Uh, and it's where, in this talk, I'm gonna just uh, focus in here. Right? I'm, go I'm gonna just give you an overview on, on what I'm doing with, this, with these things. Right, um, in particular, I'm interested in, in, in the growing of, of, of membranes in this case, that this could be of what I can model with a membrane. In this case, it could be uh, a tissue, for example, like a, uh, like a flat tissue, right? I'm interested on the growth uh, on, on the level of the surface. And I'm gonna do a further assumption is just thinking that this is a very thin material. So this means that the, if you know, if you grab a material, you bend this, you're gonna have a compression and a stretching, but there is a surface that never deformed, which is called the, 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 the neutral surface. And I'm gonna try to only focus on this. This means that the bending and the stretching, they are not, uh, you, as you will see in a moment, they are not connected with each other. Because if I bend something, as you know, in the material, you are going to compress and you're also going to stretch. And the, the idea in here is I can just represent this membrane as a manifold. I can just represent this as a, as a manifold. I use the property of that manifold to describe the mechanics of, of that membrane, right? Uh, later on, we're going to use this framework to uh, study uh, wrinkle formation, for example. Right. So this is, this is what I said. The idea in here is just to uh, grab the properties, the mathematical property of that manifold, which is going to be the metric on the system, which is called uh, usually the first fundamental form and the second fundamental form that also give you an idea about the curvature of the of the membrane. And one of the good things about this is that I can just uh, grab a reference state where this membrane was at some point or an idealized state, right? And I'm going to call this, the, this reference state, I'm going to call this uh, I'm going to hold it there. This is my reference state where I'm going to measure everything from there. And then I can just measure the strain of that, that or the deformation of the membrane, but simply subtracting this the, the reference metric in one state minus this reference state uh, that I have before. Right? And, and if I use this framework, I can, and, and as a physicist, you can just 
uh, work out what is the the, the uh, energy of of that system in general, right? And this is what you see in here. So the energy of this system is related to some material tensor, which is this uh, what I call this elastic tensor, and the strain tensor on the system. Look that up to here. I haven't done anything with uh, the bending and the uh, and the stretching. Uh, at this moment, everything is linked with each other, right? So if I wanted to decouple these two things, you know, on what is called the thin um, uh, a thin membrane approach, I need to do something else. I need to uh, make some assumptions on this, right? But before I just show you what assumptions um, uh, I'm just taking, you might just wonder why I'm just complicating myself in this. Uh, if you study mechanics, you know that you can just go and study the, the, the hook law or any derivation in continuum mechanics. And and, and then uh, you will see that, the, that we need the reference state. And usually what we, uh, Think about this reference state is a state in where it's in a stress-free state. Okay. So I measure everything with respect to this stress-free state. So this reference state that I was just talking about, it has to be stress-free when I'm just building my theory. Right. Now the problem with this is that most of the biological system, uh, they have residual stresses. They they, they are not stress-free, especially when when growth uh, is present in the system. Right? So the idea of, of introducing uh, this, uh, what is called covariant elasticity, where I'm using these ideas of many folds and, 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 and metrics and, and these kind of things, is that I can just build a theory in where it's not necessary for me to have a reference state, which is a stress state, right? So that, that's the main idea. The only assumption that I'm doing here is to say that the, that energy that I just wrote before, there is a reference state in where that energy vanishes. Okay, and this is this is nothing special. This is in a special case of the fundamental theorem of the Riemannian geometry. This is nothing special. That metric, uh, which is called this reference metric, uh, uh, is assuming that exists. Okay, so this will allow me, uh, as 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 you will see in 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 the next slides, to study a system that is um, that is not stressful. And, and non-stress-free systems in, in, in biological system, uh, this is this is uh, very common. In this case, you can see here uh, some examples, right? So um, you have, for example, a tumor growth. Uh, that is something that is not stress-free. So for example, if you have a tumor and then you cut it, then you will see that it's open up as a flower. Also, the small instant time, if you open up, then it coils down, showing that there are residual stresses in there. Uh, and the same thing with the uh, arteries or, for example, a, a simple log, uh, as you can see in there. And this is interesting because um, biological system that use this um, has been suggested that the residual stresses help to uh, stabilize the, 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 the blood vessels uh, and the arteries, for example. This is a, a paper. I, don't, I didn't put the, 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 the reference, uh, but it's at the end, I have a, a file with all of the reference that you can that you can download. Okay, so now I need to go from this 3D elasticity that I that I had before to something that is 2D. And in order to do that, um, I, I can apply something that is called the Kirchhoff law assumption. And they are very well known. The idea in here is just to think that the body is in, in, in a state of plain stress and 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 plain strain. That's essentially what, what, what you can do. And if you do this, one of the things that happens is that you decouple this stretching with this, this compression, right? And then you decouple this in two, in two parts. The one that goes with H, this is the, the stretching uh, part. And the other one that goes like H cubed is the bending part, right? So now I have two parts that are completely coupled uh, with each other. Right, and, and what I'm gonna present to you now is, uh, is, is basically going uh, even further. We are gonna discretize the system. And the way to discretize this is we can grab that equation that is in there and we can discretize this using triangles, right, triangular mesh. And then we can apply the dynamics uh, on each of the vertex of this triangular mesh. And the, these energies that I was telling you, they, they are gonna be defined in, in, or in, in a vertex or in an edge or in a triangle in this case, right? And the growth, I'm gonna introduce growth um, through the reference method. So now what I'm gonna do is just grab this idealized state where this idealist state is the one that is gonna induce the growth, right? So in this case, I'm gonna growth the reference metric, right? Idealize, I'm gonna grow this. I'm gonna 
And then the system on itself mechanically is going to accommodate to that given growth. That, that is the whole idea in here. But not just only that, with this kind of um, uh, theory, we can also introduce in, in the discrete form at least, we can also introduce viscoelasticity. In this case, this is a very simple Maxwell model. But the, what it does is very simple. It just grabs the, the reference metric and relax this ref reference metric to the real state in the, in the system. And that 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 it will be, this is my model, right? And when I was studying this, when we developed this model, we were interested in in general in wrinkle formation, right? And these uh, wrinkles, uh, they are all around the uh, the the biological world. And in one of the the places that uh, I just came across, um, it was in, in biofilm formation. In this case, are uh, is Bacillus sativus biofilm, which when I was doing my postdoc uh, work on this. This is a uh, surface air biofilm. And what you do is you spot um, a liquid culture into an agar surface in where they have all of the nutrients. And, and then what you see is this kind of uh, movies. You see that the colony just grows up, it just forms certain thickness. Uh, and then you have the coffee ring that is what I was showing before. And this just expand uh, in the, uh, on the surface. And as you can see, you, you can see that there are the, this, this formation this, of these wrinkles, right? So I was interested uh, at, the, at, at the time, you know, about how this actually wrinkles form in general. And this is what I'm gonna try to show you in this talk. So uh, growth, in this case, we, as I said, we, we are trying to look at the growth uh, in this kind of uh, circular <clears throat> uh, patches, right? And we're interested in the in the radial growth. So in the part we, we had imagined that we already have this um, this a, a, a radial uh, biofilm already formed. There is no wrinkles; it's just flat. And then uh, we introduce growth through this bike growth. In this case, we just have a reference metric in where each of these triangles <coughs> changes the the reference state with time. And this is a this is the formula that you see in there. This is just basically uh, radial growth. Uh, and then we have a viscous dissipation, as I was saying uh, before, which is this uh, this kind of Maxwell model, right? And in particular, we're interested uh, in the non-equilibrium regime, okay? Uh, because most of the tidal growth they done they are done uh, adiabatically, right? Uh, so we are, we are interested in a study what happens if you introduce more material in a system in where cannot relax elastically, okay? So we're very interested in, in see what, what happened with these kind of systems, right? And, and in here you see um, some of the results. This is that the, the, the system it has the same material properties. Uh, they, they never change. The only thing that have changed is the growth rate. So what you can see is that uh, by growing out of equilibrium, you see that the system, uh, it has uh, much more access to certain configurations that they wouldn't have otherwise, okay? And this this was quite, kind of like a surprise, right? And then you can see here, for example, how this changed with the with the viscoelasticity and with the with the growth rate. So uh, the uh, the viscous part is on the x-axis, and the um, metric, what it will be the growth, is on the on the y-axis. And then you can see that there are many geometrical shapes that you can access just by changing just the growth rate out of the equilibrium, right? But now you might just wonder, well. I mean, this is this is great, uh, but how much energy actually does it cost to just build this kind of structures? And as you might expect, if I just measure the energy or how much it's gonna cost to build this kind of complicated kind of structures, right? You would expect that, uh, that I, I have to inject a lot of energy into the system, right? In order to build this structure. And this is what you're seeing here. So if you look at this over time, you see that the orange curve that you're seeing there, uh, this is a, a, a uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the most complicated structures, right? And then you see that you need to introduce a lot of energy into the system in order to form that structure base in there. On the contrary, if the structure is simpler, right? You need to introduce less energy into the system. But now we wonder, well, what happens if we just make the system, instead of growing at, at a constant rate, right? If we just make the system grow at the at a given rate that is that overcome the smallest energy barrier uh, that, that we can, then this will be the, the blue curve that you see in there, right? And then as soon as you overcome this barrier, we can change the growth rate 
into the into the one that is more complex, right? And what we see is that uh, if you do that, you obtain uh, very similar patterns, even if you haven't overcome this very large energy barrier, right? And what we argue is that actually this is something that a uh, biological system do all the time. They can just adapt and change the growth rates and, and material properties and so forth on the fly, depending on the physical cues and the biochemical cues that are in, in into the system. Right? Of course, that you don't have to believe me that this is sort of the, 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 the shapes, but you, know, you can see in here that this is sort of the, the, uh, the spectrum of the height for different annulus into the system for the different cores, and then you can see that this approach to the more complex uh, structure, okay? But now I haven't I haven't told you anything about uh, how to control this morphological structure. So far, I haven't, I haven't told you anything about if there is any way to uh, have a morphological structure and just generate some uh, biochemical, uh, change the biochemical cues uh, by the morphological structure. But at the end of the day, that is something that, uh, that would be very interesting to do, right? And we wanted to do this not just only because uh, there is a there is a biological uh, problem or question in there that attracts uh, attract physicists, but also uh, if we do this, we we might just be able to also develop new uh, type of, uh, for example, robotics. In this case, what I'm going to show you, this is a this is a, is a is a gel in where if you shine light, this gel swallow. And inside it has some uh, rods that if you introduce some magnetic fields, you can make this actually work. So there is a, there is a feedback in here, right? But in order to do this, we did an external input, okay? Which is the light and the, uh, and, and the, and the field, okay? Um, so in order to introduce this, 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 uh, this feedback, we just focus uh, in, in, in what I'm gonna show you next, we focus on, uh, Chemical response and, uh, responsive out, uh, autonomous polymeric, uh, polymeric shells. These shells are basically they, they are um, there is a shelling where there is a chemical reaction on the surface of that shell. Okay, uh, the type of chemical reaction is a, is a BC reaction, which is not that is similar to the the, the TAC uh, metabolic process in the uh, the Krebs cycle. And, and they, they, these were experiments that they didn't understand why they were having this kind of uh, football, deflated footballs and things like that. So uh, what we did is just trying to understand what happened now if we mix mechanics with the, with the, these this, uh, chemicals signals. Right? Uh, they, for example, see this is the first image, the, the first movie that you see, they say they, they see this kind of beating behaviors that you see into, in, in, in the system. So we were having this kind of question, like how there is this mechanical feedback loops uh, in this type of system. So what we did is just use the same theory that we had before, but on top of that, we added uh, a chemical uh, a reaction diffusion equation in top of the shell, okay, on the shell. Right? And then we just, now our growth is not something that it depends, uh, that, that it doesn't depend on, on, on nothing, but in this case, now the growth, it depends on the concentration of the of one of the chemicals. In this case, what it happens with this, the shells is that they become more hydrophilic or hydrophobic, right? So this chemical is a it is a catalyzer that uh, oxidizes or the the system only, and they just make the, the shells be more hydrophobic or hydrophilic, right? That is how you they are linked essentially. Right? And now, if we do this, we can just reproduce uh, the some of the experimental results, right? Uh, and then you can see that we have this kind of beating behavior, like a, like a heartbeat behavior. But also we can reproduce um, the the this deflated football if you have some experimental uh, um, some experimental um, problems with the thickness on the on the shell. If the thickness is not uniform, right? Then you can see that this actually deflates, right? And the way that this mechanical feedback uh, loop works is just because you, you have the the concentration get diluted every time that the that the, that the shells expand. They just get diluted, and when it gets diluted, the 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 shell changes uh, the, the, the 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 reaction diffusion equation, which in turn it changes also the mechanics on the system. Right, and even more, we can also um, we can also generate even more complex shapes, as you can see here, like these mushroom shapes that they actually deform autonomously into in the system. 
Right. Um, oh, this was perfect. Um, so uh, to sum up, um, what I'm, I, I show you today is a model of a thin sheet mechanics that it can just uh, be out of equilibrium. And what we found is that change it by changing the growth rate, we can just access a certain morphologies and, and diversity of shapes that you wouldn't be able to do if the system is in, in uh, adiabatically. And also that we can introduce very simple mechanical chemical feedback loops by just uh, coupling this uh, reference metric that I was telling you before of the growth with the uh, with, with the chemical in general. And thank you. And this is some of my collaborators on, on which we did uh, some of the work. And if you are interested in this, I have created a Google Doc in where you have some of the reference uh, in there. And if you think there is any reference missing, please uh, uh, send me an email and we add it in there. The idea is that this uh, helps the introduction into the subject to people that, uh, uh, that otherwise they wouldn't be able to do it. Okay. Thank you.